everyone got worried because if the Russians are able to subdue Ukraine, when they come to Poland, it's not going to be a fight. It's going to be a slaughter. NATO forces versus Russia, you know, you're talking about casualty ratios in excess of 100 to 1,000 to 1. I mean, it'll be a blowout. And in that scenario, the Russians will use nukes. So the decision was made early that any weapon system that the Ukrainians can prove that they can operate and maintain, very important detail, maintain, they can have. And so we've just been steadily ratcheting up the technical assistance in order to help them absorb as much as possible. F-16s are the newest one, and this will continue. Because as long as we keep the fight in Ukraine, then we don't have to worry about a general nuclear exchange over Poland or Romania or Latvia or now Finland. The risk moving forward, and I don't think we're going to reach this this year, is let's say the Ukrainians are wildly successful and they manage to get the Russians out of all of their territory inside, including Crimea. That doesn't stop the war. The Russians will keep pushing until they can't. And now that they've paid the price for a war but gotten none of the benefits, yeah, they, they can't back down now. It would lead to national disin it lead to government disintegration. Russia usually faces revolutions when it's defe defeated in a war, which means that Ukraine has to cross the border into Russia to break up the logistical capacity of the Russians to launch the war in the first place. And at a minimum, that means neutralizing Belgorod and Rostov-on-Don. And now if you've got Ukrainian forces crossing the border, all of a sudden the nuclear question comes back into play from a defensive point of view. So we are only at the very beginning of this conflict. I gotta admit, I am shocked at how well the Ukrainians have done. I've never been so happy to be wrong. I was convinced that this was all gonna be wrapped up in under a year, but the Russians can't back down. And in the end of the day, if the Ukrainians are great, they have to push forward. So this is going to become a broader conflict one way or another. And that introduces a lot of wild cards that we're not ready for. And I'm not sure we can. Well, let's start with the, the offensive issue. The problem with predicting what's going to happen with this war is for the Ukrainians, they're doing everything for the first time. So they repelled an assault with the first time using irregular forces. They launched an infantry heavy assault on Kharkiv for the first time. They're now getting ready to do a combined arms for the first time. Just we have no track record here to draw from. As for the Russians, they have underperformed by every possible measure. And so, yes, they've built a lot of defensive fortifications. But if their defensive fortifications were built like their military was planned, well, then they're probably not worth anything. So we just don't know. As for the Chinese, I don't think so. I think we'd have to have a pretty sharp change in circumstance for the Chinese to even consider getting involved. They know that if they provide lethal aid, that that will flip the Europeans from being neutral to hostile. And we're actually kind of edging in that direction already. It's really only the Germans and the French who are still kind of towing the line that we need to have a constructive partnership with the Chinese. Weapons would shift that completely. The Germans really have bellied up to the bar over the course of the last six months, and they're, they're in it to win it now. That doesn't mean that the Chinese can't provide some assistance. There's non-lethal aid that is already flowing, and more importantly are the semiconductors that can come up and help the Russians finish some of the weapons that they used to rely on off-the-shelf technology from the West, which I always thought was, from a security point of view, really, really, really dumb. But, you know, globalization has done some strange things. So the Chinese are now the primary vehicle for getting that sort of help in. And that is really important. If there was some way to lock that off, it would really hurt the Russians in terms of missiles and especially optics on things like tanks. But for now, those flows are there. Providing more than that risks a rupture. And in the today's environment, when the Chinese are under pressure from so many different angles, someone targeting trade directly would probably enough be enough to push them over the edge. Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid that the green transition in its current form is a horrible idea. The technology really just isn't ready. Solar panels and wind turbines are great if you're in places that are sol sunny or windy, but that's not where 85% of the world's population lives. And in most places, especially places like Moscow or Berlin or Paris or New York or Toronto, if you put up solar panels, you're never going to generate enough electricity to pay down the carbon debt that it took to build them in the first place. Just leave the economics to the side. The carbon side is a disaster. But there's a broader problem here, and that's we won't be able to build the stuff in the first place. 
If we really do want to decarbonize and hit net zero, then by the year 2030, we need two to three times as much copper and 10 times as much nickel and 18 times as much lithium and on and on and on and on. Humanity has never doubled the volume of any industrial material that was already in use in a 10 year period. And now we have to do this for 11 different materials and a lot more than doubling. No, can't be done. Now there's enough out there for the United States, but that would require the United States conquering Congo and taking a big bite out of Northern Russia and parts of Northern China and South Africa. You know, that's probably not going to happen. We just need a new technological breakthrough in material science before we do this at scale. So I'm, I'm concerned that a lot of what we're doing right now is wasting capital and increasing our carbon footprint in the name of reducing our carbon footprint. Let, let's start by saying that when it comes to international institutions, they only have as much power as their member states give them. And that makes them fairly truncated. They're talk shops that's useful, but they're not into governance in any meaningful way. The institution that's going to be most important moving forward is the U.S. Federal Reserve. We're entering a world where most of the major countries don't have enough young people to consume. And what is monetary policy if not the ability to regulate consumption? So we have exited the last period of synchronized global consumption-led growth. We'll never have that again because there aren't enough people. And when we get to the next downturn, whenever that is, only the Federal Reserve is going to have the tools necessary in order to stimulate consumption in the United States again, which means the United States de facto is going to be setting monetary policy for the world because the Europeans, the Japanese and the rest won't be able to do anything. It doesn't matter if you drop interest rates, if there's no one there to buy. So we're seeing this breakup and this unification of the global economic system all at the same time with one authority basically setting policy for everyone, but the trade links that allowed that policy to percolate everywhere more or less going away. We're, we're entering unknown territory here. I mean, we've had ups and downs and unifications and breakups and trade systems over and over and over through history, but we've never had the sort of build that we've seen under globalization, where we basically all joined a single global whole with differentiated supply chains and materials crossing the globe as a matter of course. There was also always population growth before. So even if you did break away, you'd still have something to build on. We don't have that. If we do have a degree of breakup, there are places that have more going for them than others. One of the big things about globalization is the United States basically declared that geography doesn't matter that we'll take care of security, you can access our market and everyone else's market as long as you side with us against the Soviets. And that created the global system. You break that down and geography matters again because you're gonna have to do a lot of it yourselves. The four countries that kind of have the magic mix of geographic features that give them security and an economic shot are France, especially post EU, Turkey today, although they have to get through a financial crisis first, Japan, which even though it has horrible demographics, it's been grappling with this and addressing that issue now for 40 years and has done a decent job. And Argentina, which I will never say as a country you should follow financially, but they have the assets and the physical location to persist in their current form for at least another century. And compared to most countries, that's, that's just not on the cards. Those plus the United States, those five are the ones that are going to be able to influence their own neighborhoods to their own liking. And then there's kind of a secondary set where the demographics are pretty good, the security is pretty good. They won't be able to project power, but they're going to be very good by themselves. All of Southeast Asia falls into that bucket. And a fair amount of Latin America, especially Mexico, does as well. So we're, it's not that we're going to see a world of no growth. It's we're going to see a very split world with some parts of it doing very, very well. While we had been involved in World War I, uh, with D-Day and the push to Berlin, it really was just American forces carrying the load. And once we got a taste of just how destructive industrial warfare in Europe could be, we realized that if we were ever going to contain the Soviet Union, uh, the commitment in troops and lives were going to be something that the American population would have never supported. So we needed allies, and we needed allies that were willing, knowingly, to be cannon fodder in a conflict between the Americans and the Soviets. So we set up an economic system that would induce people to join our side. You've heard of Bretton Woods, you've heard of the IMF and the World Bank, but these are all pieces of globalization. 
the idea that the United States would use its military power on the high oceans to enable anyone to go anywhere at any time and interface with any partner and access any raw material at any market. In essence, it was like everyone who joined our side would have had all the economic benefits of having won the war all by themselves. And it triggered the greatest period of industrialization and economic growth and personal income growth in human history. And it lasted for 75 years. And that's how we all got electricity. That's how we all got plumbing. That's how we all got the internet and products from China and raw materials from Africa and energy from the Middle East. Uh, this is our world in a nutshell. But there's, there's two problems. Number one, the Cold War is over. And even with the Russian resurgence in Ukraine, there has not been a hint of talk out of the Biden administration about reinvigorating globalization. It's a bilateral security series of agreements, and that's it. We actually have not stopped prosecuting our trade wars against even the Europeans, uh, with the exception of uh, one deal with Airbus. Everything else is still going. Biden is still putting body into Trump's tweets when it comes to trade disputes. And then second, when we industrialized, we all started living differently. It used to be that if you had food and coal and iron ore and oil, you could have a modern economy. But that changed with globalization because before 90% of the world's population didn't have those things. With globalization, you only needed one and you could trade for all the others. And so the whole world started moving up. That's one of the reasons why the alliance was so potent. Everyone was part of it. But when you industrialize, you start taking manufacturing and services jobs and you specialize and you move off the farm and into town. And on the farm, kids are free labor, you have loads. But when you're in town, kids are really expensive, really annoying, really aggravating pieces of mobile furniture. And adults aren't dumb, we had fewer of them. You play that forward 75 years and the advanced world hasn't run out of children. That happened 30 years ago. We're now running out of adults. And so it's been a bit of a starvation diet as the population has aged. When everyone was in their 20s and their 30s, we got this massive consumption boom. Think of what happened in the 70s with the baby boomers or in the 2000s with the Chinese. When everyone's in their 40s and 50s, you get this big productivity boom. Think about the United States in the 1990s or the Koreans for the last 30 years. But then you all hit retirement and it's over. And for most of the world's demographic structures, we do not even have an economic model that suggests they can function in a world unless someone pays them to exist. That doesn't happen very often. And so everything about globalization is in its final decade. And I would argue conflicts like the Ukraine war are the harbingers of what's to come. Uh, there are a series of military conflicts that are going to break out because of changes of consumption, production, investment. Uh, and then another series that are going to break out, out because the United States is stepping back from the world. Uh, the Ukraine war is just the first. Right now, we have at any given time over 10,000 ships on the waves that are traveling completely without any sort of escort. Uh, about half of those travel within their own region, but half of those in, by half of those by volume are transoceanic. That is the entirety of global energy trade and global manufacturers trade, and it's the input stream for 80% of global agriculture. So if that cracks, you're looking at a catastrophic failure. Uh, we've only had to deal with you know Somalis and speedboats from a piracy point of view to this point. Uh, but we're very close to the position where the United States and the Europeans are going to start grab Russian shipping. And so once the real countries start doing that, all bets are off. The United States is not particularly well thought in a lot of its policies, domestic or international. That's not new. This falls into that category. Uh, number two, the greatest supporter of illegal migration in American history was the Trump administration. Because the Sonoran and the Chihuahuan deserts are the best natural borders in North America. And by building a wall down the middle of it, we had to build 50 roads to go through the desert to reach the construction sites. And so we took half of the best barrier we've ever had to illegal migration 
and obviated it. And we wouldn't have nowhere near the number of illegals crossing in if it wasn't for that program. Because all you have to do to get to the United States now is cross half the desert and use a ladder once. And Trump took care of the rest. I mean, it's for what it's worth, though, this isn't something that's going to last too much longer. Um, Mexico started industrializing with the adoption of NAFTA in 1995, and their birth rate dropped by half. So net migration from Mexico to the United States has been negative for 12 of the last 13 years. So it'll probably never be positive again. Central America started industrializing in 2000, and their birth rate dropped by half. So this is probably the last surge. Within five years, this is probably not going to be a significant problem. Well, you've all heard of the one-child policy that was adopted roughly 40 years ago. And the communist-turned-fascist bureaucracy basically penalized people with fines and up to jail time if they had more than one kid. Uh, It got to the point that there were a lot of forced abortions. You do that for 40 years. uh, And you've guaranteed that your population under age 30 will be half of what it was before. But that wasn't the only thing going on. At the same time that the one-child policy was at its height, the Chinese were rapidly industrializing and they were moving off the farm and into the cities and having fewer kids anyway. So it has been the fastest population collapse in human history, faster than the Black Death in Europe. And it's left us with a population now that cannot regenerate. So a few years ago, the Chinese finally realized that they may have overcompensated a little bit and changed it to a two-child policy. Now it's a three-child policy, and I think it's in the process of being formally abandoned. And the bureaucrats that were once responsible for the forced abortions are now responsible for encouraging kids to have, or having, encouraging people to have more kids. But China's already urbanized. Everyone's already living in efficiency apartments. There's no room for the kids in their lives, physically or mentally. And so the birth rate is actually continuing to drop. And in places like Beijing and Shanghai, on average, a woman only has 0.75 kids over their lifetimes now. So it's not that we're below replacement. We were below replacement 30 years ago. We are now in full-on population collapse. And the Chinese are grudgingly admitting publicly that they have already that they have overcounted their population by 100 million in that time, suggesting that we are looking at full demographic and economic collapse this decade, assuming nothing else goes wrong. And in just the last week, the Biden administration basically killed their entire tech sector. So plenty of other things are going wrong. Uh, Their economy is partially integrated with the mainland. I think that's the biggest point of exposure. I think that was unwise on their part, but, you know, people do what people do. Uh, the, the Xi government in China has become ossified. It, it's a cult of personality that is tighter than any we've ever seen before, including the Kim dynasty in North Korea. And there is no one who wants to bring Xi any information. Not information that they think will make him mad, any information at all. And so he's making a series of bad and increasingly disconnected from reality decisions. Uh, but it's the Ukraine war that I think has really changed the calculus. The, the Chinese use the Russians as kind of a canary when they're thinking of doing something. They let the Russians do it first, see outside how it comes out. Uh, so like the liberalization in the 1980s is a great example. They, they saw perestroika and glasnost in action. It led to the fall of the Soviet Union. They're like, whoa, whoa, we're not doing that. Uh, and it's happening with the Ukraine war. So number one, they thought the war would be easy. Uh, but you can walk to Kiev. You have to swim to Taipei. And Kiev has only been preparing for this war for eight years. Taiwan has been preparing for 45. So like, okay, 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 this is going to be a harder war than we thought. Assumption number two, we assume that Russian weapons are really good. And so they cloned Russian weapons for most of their military buildup. And now they have massive buyers or theft remorse, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so, you know, assumption two is gone. <laughs> a little Freudian, little Freudian <laughs> slip there, huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, And in a quick logic chain threading from geography to population patterns to transport needs to debt markets, you now understand how Mexico's regular bouts of debt crisis are both endemic and inevitable. And then there is its government. Meaningful central authority has a prerequisite, the ability to reach all portions of the territory. Not only is that far from a given in Mexico, 
but much of what transport infrastructure exists is beholden to the needs of the oligarchs. Its use is not automatically available to the government. Making matters worse, the oligarchs have tended to develop the most useful patches of land. In Mexico's too dry mountainous north or its too wet mountainous south, there is little of economic interest and thus little oligarch activity and little infrastructure. Upwards of half of Mexican territory, concentrated in the far north and far south, exists in a sort of Hobbesian limbo where anyone who wishes to exert sufficient resources can make his will a temporary reality. Mexico's borderlands are zones so lightly populated that local authorities cannot police them, and they have so little infrastructure that national authorities cannot reach them on a meaningful time scale. Even in periods of plenty, these areas will always be insufficiently patrolled and so will always be smuggling zones and can never be secured in the way that Americans define the term. In essence, Mexico lacks the geographic characteristics to be a successful state. Geography condemns it to be home to a poor, drastically unequal, underdeveloped society riven by regional and class-based cleavages that no degree of local investment or understanding can ever heal. The only other significant country in the world that was dealt as bad a geographic hand as Mexico is perhaps Afghanistan. If not for a few lucky oil discoveries around 1900, Mexico would have likely faded into oblivion long ago. But as wretched as Mexico seems from time to time, no serious observer would say that it is even remotely as bad as Afghanistan. The reason for that is quite simple. It is next to the United States, the global consuming superpower. Somewhat ironically, Mexico's weakness has become the key factor in ensuring its success. The sheer difference between the two countries' topographies, America's capital richness versus Mexico's capital poverty, America's ease of development versus Mexico's constant struggle, ensures that Mexican labor will always be both cheap and underutilized, making Mexican labor perennially attractive to anyone wanting to service America's nearly bottomless demand. In that deferential lies the core of Mexico's economic success. In the next couple of decades, a shift of circumstances will turn Mexico from the United States' extremely junior partner to something significantly more. Four factors are at work. 1. Chinese labor costs have skyrocketed. No country lost out to China's emergence onto the international scene as much as Mexico. Prior to China's joining the WTO in 2001, Mexico was the primary source of textiles and low-end manufactured goods to the United States. Despite China's many internal weaknesses, its ability to subsidize its inputs and outputs and marry them to low-cost labor in an environment of centralized political control allowed it to undercut countries like Mexico that relied on mid-cost labor and proximity. But those days are over. Leaving aside the issues of China's political stability, or lack thereof, ability to continue subsidizing its output, or lack thereof, and ability to manipulate the international economic system, or lack thereof, it has simply run out of cheap labor. Since 2002, Chinese labor has increased in cost by a factor of six to about $3 per hour. In relative terms, Chinese labor has increased from being one quarter as expensive as Mexican labor to one quarter more expensive. Considering that Mexico already has far superior transport access to the United States, and that there is a decades-old tradition of collaboration between American management and Mexican oligarchs, the numbers certainly are positioned for a labor cost-driven onshoring to Mexico. 2. American shale is supercharging the Mexican electricity system. Due to shale, the Americans have a massive glut in their natural gas system. Unlike crude oil, natural gas is, well, a gas, and the transportation of gases is difficult. There are only two means of getting it out of a supersaturated market. The first is to cool it into a liquid, about minus 260 degrees Fahrenheit, and then ship it to someone who has the infrastructure capacity to safely return it to gaseous form. This liquefied natural gas, LNG, process is the only way to ship the stuff across an ocean. However, there are also many regulatory steps involved, and as recent energy politics in the United States have amply demonstrated, gaining national approval for a transnational energy infrastructure project is somewhat difficult, not to mention that freezing natural gas into liquid form is as expensive as it sounds. While dozens of projects have applied for regulatory approval, only a small handful have achieved the necessary permits at the local, state, and national levels, and construction has only begun on one. Chenier's Sabine Pass facility began construction in 2013 and is expected to begin operations in 2016. That leaves a lot of shale natural gas stranded in the American interior, practically begging for a market. 
But one of the great open secrets of the American energy complex is that it is already legal to export natural gas so long as it is by pipe and so long as it goes to Mexico. As of the beginning of the shale boom, there were already nine natural gas pipelines crossing the border, supplying Mexico with nearly one quarter of its natural gas needs, about one billion cubic feet per day. BCFD. Since the shale boom, however, work has begun on three major corridors as well as expansions throughout the export system in order to marry the ultra-cheap American natural gas to the Mexican power network and labor market. Exports doubled to 2 BCFD between 2010 and 2013, but the real growth will come in 2016. At that point, several new trunk lines will begin operation, allowing the export of U.S. energy to heretofore unreached Mexican regions up to and including the Mexico City core. Mexican imports from the United States are expected to hit 10 times their 2010 levels. Nearly all of that natural gas is planned to be used for electricity generation. Chinese competition aside, the biggest hurdle that has faced Mexican industry in recent years is reliable power supplies. The surge in shale gas into Mexico has already greatly mitigated that problem, and within a very few short years, Mexico's chronic rolling power outages will be a thing of the past. For manufacturers, whether Mexican or American, that removes one of Mexico's chronic limitations on industrial development. 3. Mexican demography generates a large market and a larger labor pool. Mexico also has a young population. Normally, this would be somewhat of a problem for a country at Mexico's stage of development. A capital-shy demographic combined with a capital-shy geography could forever trap Mexico in underdevelopment. In fact, that has been the trap Mexico has lived in ever since independence. But the positive aspects of a young population still apply. Mexico's young adults are hungry for goods and property. They just need paychecks. Luckily, their large number proportional to the overall population keeps their labor costs low and keeps foreign entities eager to invest in Mexico for goods production. While those investors may have initially been interested in selling those goods into the American market, there is every reason to service the local population as well. Doubly so, since Mexico's lack of ability to self-industrialize means that internal goods supplies are so limited. In the early years, the Americans took brutal advantage of this with the Santa Fe Trail. American manufacturers were shipped to Santa Fe, a Mexican city, in order to build economic dependency upon the United States throughout the areas we now think of as the American Southwest. At the time the Americans founded the trail, Mexico was still an imperial Spanish territory. When the Mexican-American War occurred just 35 years later, most of the sparsely populated territory... Let's start with the war. I'm going to give you a lot to work on here with oil and gas and wind and solar and transmission. Uh, but it all really comes down to the breakdown of the support structures that make everything else possible. That's what you're going to be wrestling with. What you've got on the right here is a population density map of the Russian space. Uh, north is to the right, so if you have to tilt your head, that's fine. That uh, orange V going from Central Europe into Central Siberia, that's where everybody lives. If you go to the left map, same zone, but now instead of population density, it's an economic and climate map. And on that left map, the green is the Russian wheat belt. That's where you live if you live in Russia. The weather is atrocious. You get about 20 hours of sunlight for the entire month of December, based on where you are. Cold, low productivity per acre. And when you don't get a lot of income from a wide swath of territory, infrastructure is impossible to build. So Russia, even today, does not have a national road network. You want to move stuff? It's rail or nothing. If you go to the right, to the blue, to the north, that's tundra and tegai. Nobody lives there. You go to the left, to the yellow, to the south, that's desert. No one lives there. Now, when Russians look at this, they get really depressed. Not so much by the blue or the yellow or the green, but the beige. Territories that are not economically viable but aren't really barriers either. Territories where it's really easy to shove a panzer division or a Mongol horde through. And since they're not mobile within their own territories, what has happened 50 odd times in their history is someone has crossed the beige into the green and they just rampage until Russia's weather defeats them. That's the typical Russian story. So what the Russians have always tried to do is to push out of the green, past the beige, until they can reach these geographic, geographic blocking points. The Carpathian Mountains, the Alma-Ata Mountains, the deserts of the Karakum. If they can do that, geography helps with their defense, a forward defense. 
And then they forward station static troops, because they're not mobile, in the access points between those barriers. 50 odd invasions, all of them have come through one of these access points. Now, today, the Russians are a little depressed because at the Soviet height, they controlled all those access points. When the Soviet system collapsed, they only controlled one. And everything that Putin has done in the last 22 years in his foreign policy has been about rebuilding those military footprints in those blue arcs. This is the Crimea War, the Georgia War, the Nagorno War, the Kazakh intervention. Ukraine is just unfortunate to be on the path to two of those access points. So it's not that the Russians won't stop until they have all of Ukraine. It's that the Russians won't stop when they have all of Ukraine. We're only in like stage four or five of a nine part plan here. Where are my Texans? It's not as big as you think. Just the scale of what the Russians are attempting here boggles the mind. I mean, from their core populations around Moscow, they've got to cross two Texans to get to where they need to go. It's big. Okay, here's where we are right now. The deep red are the territories the Russians controlled on the first day of the war. These are territories they grabbed back in the Donbass War of 2014. The pinkish areas are the territories they controlled on the first of this month. As you may have noticed, a lot of crap's gone down in the last few weeks. Now, the original Ukrainian plan was to move on these two bridges. These are the only two bridges that connect that sliver. Can I point this? Yeah, there. Oh, never mind. I'll just go point. The two bridges are the only parts of infrastructure that connect southern Ukraine to this chunk of occupied territory west of the Dnieper River. Only those two. And so what the Ukrainians have been doing is thinking that if they damage those bridges so they can't be used for heavy equipment, which they've done, then any Russian troops north of them are going to be fighting on their own. Difficult to reinforce, difficult to evacuate. So they advertised for two and a half months that this was imminent. And the Russians moved about 20,000 troops from other parts of the front to this zone, knowing that they were going to need more bodies and pre-positioned equipment in order to fight off that assault. That assault started two weeks ago. What the Ukrainians then did is looked at where the Russians pulled their troops from over here in the east and hit that hard. And that's where the front collapsed. That's Kharkiv province. And everything between those two areas is now back in Ukrainian hands. Now, let me give you a little bit of the backstory for the war to this point so you can understand the significance of this and what it means moving forward. You guys remember the assault on Kiev in the first week of the war when there was that 40 mile long convoy of forces? You guys remember how on the third day of the war the convoy stalled out because they forgot fuel? And on the seventh day, all the soldiers dismounted and walked back to Belarus because they also forgot food. Now, everyone took their own lessons from this. The NATO lesson was that the Russians are incapable of fighting a modern combined war conflict. They are incompetent at operating above a post-World War II level of technology. Which means, if we have a direct NATO-Russia fight, they'll be obliterated. But, the Russians see this as a fight for their existential survival. So all tools are on the table. So if the Russians do succeed in conquering Ukraine, they will then come for Romania, Poland, and the rest. NATO allies. And nukes will be their only option. So NATO is sending every possible weapon system that we can to the Ukrainians that they can use as fast as they can learn to use them. Because we have to kill the Russian war machine in Ukraine. This is where Russia's future is decided. This is where NATO's future is decided in Ukraine. We can't have a direct fight. It's got to be the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians and the Russians took different lessons. The Ukrainians had a national consolidation around the defeat at Kiev and have been kicking some serious sins. The Russians now realize that their propaganda was just that propaganda and the Ukrainians are never going to welcome them in. Welcome them in. And if the Ukrainians are not wayward Russians who are going to come back into the fold, they are the enemy. And so the policy of genocide started. And the Russians began uh, advancing slowly, no more than a mile a day, behind an unfaltering wave of artillery barbarment. And in two months, they fired over two and a half million shells, 
which is about how many were fired in a year in World War II. The goal is simple. Target every single piece of civilian infrastructure you see to make the land uninhabitable. And that way the population self-selects into two groups. Group one runs. They become refugees. You never have to worry about them again. Group two are fighters and you can kill them on sight. So once the army moves forward, the Wagner group, the mercenaries, and the Chechen forces come in and just cleanse the area. We don't have firm numbers because very little of the territory even now has been liberated, but best guess is about a quarter of a million Ukrainians have been kidnapped and taken to Siberia, mostly children, and at least that many, again, have been killed. Again, we just don't know. We do know from German radio intercepts that the atrocities that were ever uncovered at Bucha after the Kiev withdrawal and at Izmen after the um, <clears throat> Kharkiv withdrawal are only two of about 90 examples of what has happened in occupied territory so far. Uh, it's gotten to the point that the United Nations and various NGOs have literally run out of staff to investigate the war crimes that they've already found in just the first week after the liberation in Izmen. The Russians are, making, are not making any effort to hide it. Okay, that's where we are right now. Okay, back to this map. Now let's look at the red, the natural gas. Uh, the, uh, the drama of the moment is Nord Stream. Now that is a subsea pipeline that goes directly from Russia under the Baltic all the way to Germany. It is their primary support. It is what allows their industry to function and at the moment it is offline. The Russians have been jacking with it with ever more seriousness ever since they started having problems back post Kiev. The problem is marginal supply. Energy prices, because energy demand is broadly inelastic, takes its entire pricing structure from whatever that last few percent is. The Russians, excuse me, the Germans, because of the Energiewende and the shutting down of the nuclear plants, have removed a lot of their base load. And then the Russian stuff happened on top of that. And so almost all of their supply, the majority of the supply now is marginal. And so of course their prices are very, 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 very high. Now the problem in Germany versus the United States is not just the availability of supply. The problem is that we're a lot less interested in where our inputs come from. And being a large diversified economy like the United States, like NAFTA, means that a lot of things come from a lot of places and the margin can't demand what it wants like it can in Germany. Because in Germany, they take Russian cheap natural gas, they process that into petrochemicals, that is the foundation of their heavy and their medium manufacturing, including automotive. You remove that base material, the rest of the German manufacturing system collapses. And we're already seeing shutdowns at places like BASF. German manufacturing will be dead within a year and a half. I know that we're used to being more worried about China here, but Germany's not coming back. If the war ended tomorrow, it's probably already too late. We're now in a situation where the pipelines that flow through the war zones are Germany's only reliable supply. This is going to get significantly worse for them. Anyone use steel? Do we care about steel? Okay, working from left to right, you mine the iron ore, you throw it into a blast furnace, you get an intermediate product called pig iron, and then based on how good you are and what you need, you turn it into hot or cold rolled steel. Hot rolled is the ugly stuff. We use that for automobile frames and I-beams, places where you won't see it. Cold rolled is the pretty stuff. You use that for cladding and high-end uh, manufacturing. You guys are primarily interested in the hot rolled for pipes. Now here in the United States, again, we're pretty agnostic about where we get stuff. So we don't do a lot of the core blast furnace smelting. We will take someone else's pig iron and we will then turn that into our finished product for pipes. We make about half of what we use. We import the other half. One of our largest suppliers of pipes used to be Russia. Eh. The half that we make ourselves is almost exclusively made with imported pig iron, of which three quarters of which comes from Russia and Ukraine. Now, Russia is obviously a political issue. 
Ukraine is a non-issue. The entire Ukrainian metals industry is offline. Either it's in a place like Zapranitsa, where the power is out, it's in a place like Donetsk, where it's been captured, or in some place like Mariupol, where it's been destroyed. We've lost about 10% of global steel capacity because of the war, and we've lost about three quarters of access to pig iron on a global scale. On the off chance you care about green tech. It's not as simple as most people think. What we've got here are the materials that go into various sorts of green tech. At the top, vehicles. At the bottom, power generation. It's about an order of magnitude more complicated in terms of sourcing the materials in the first place. And the things that have boxes around them, that's where Russia is a primary supplier. We can't have globally financially accessible volumes of fossil fuels without the Russians. And we absolutely cannot do the green transition without them. All right, one more minor issue before we get to the big stuff. Let me give you the punchline first. This is China's last decade. Three big things. First of all, Chairman Xi has created a cult of personality that is so extreme and he has shot the messenger literally so many times that no one wants to bring him any information. I mean, this is worse than what's going on with Putin. Putin insists that he is lied to and will get rid of anyone who tells him the truth. No one even wants to approach Chairman Xi because they have no idea what's going on in his head and how whatever fact they give him is going to play to the chorus. He has consolidated more power to himself than any leader in world history. More than Mao, more than the Chinese emperors of old, more than the Kim dynasty in North Korea, more than Donald Trump, more than anyone. And as a result, we're seeing policy collapses across the entire system. The two most dramatic, we had power outages that started last March. It's apparent that G didn't know they happened until September. We didn't get a policy to deal with it until November, and they're only now getting patched up. And of course, the other one is COVID. Now, we're in Texas. I'm going to assume there's a diversity of opinions on natural immunity versus vaccines. But I think in the quiet of our own homes in the dark, we will admit to ourselves at least that the other side may have a couple of relevant points. Right? Is that fair? In China, neither of these are options. Natural immunity isn't an option because the Chinese have, until now, fairly successfully kept COVID out of the population. So no one has natural immunity. And from the vaccine side, the Chinese vaccines don't work. They, they worked barely against the original wild strain out of Wuhan. And everyone in China has pretty much got that now. But then we had Alpha and Beta and now Omicron, Delta, Threatcon, Fuchsia 7, or wherever we are now. And they don't work at all. So if China were to open, you're talking about two to five million deaths a month for at least six months. And in a cult of personality system where the buck literally stops with the top guy, that is a regime ending event. So lockdowns are their only option. We've got about 90 million Chinese under hard lockdown right now, about another 250 million under soft lockdown. You can't run a modern economy like that. The Germans are in recession because of energy. I would say that the Chinese would be in recession because of energy if they weren't in recession already because of COVID. So this is going to be the situation until the Chinese can catch up with a better vaccine that is domestically produced because they've spent the last two and a half years saying that the American ones make you magnetic and infertile. So they're not going to import them. By the way, if you believe those things, that's Chinese propaganda. If you think they're going to rewrite your DNA, that's Russian propaganda. Oh. Next crisis. <laughs> Three years ago, the Chinese had an outbreak of something called African swine fever. It's basically Ebola for pigs. Doesn't communicate to humans, thank God, but, you know, messy. <sighs> they say they wiped it out. If you look at a heat map of where cases are in East Asia, all of Chinese borders are raging with ASF, but there's not a single case within China. Yeah, right. In an information-controlled system that is a cult of personality that is having a medical crisis, and 
Flirting with an energy crisis, one of the few remaining pillars of legitimacy is food supply. The chances that they're going to lose pork again are pretty high. The last time they had to wipe out two-thirds of their herd. All that's left in that situation is rice. Rice is the most phosphate demanding crop humans grow. China is the world's largest supplier. They've shut their borders to exports. So just on top of everything with Ukraine, we're also losing, have lost, one of the largest things that allow us to keep 8 billion people alive. This is the USS Ford. This is our newest supercarrier, most powerful military platform humans have ever built. By itself, one Ford class can take on any but the top seven air forces in the world. That assumes the Navy fights fair. The Navy never fights fair. The whole idea of the Navy is the ships can move, so you get to choose the time and the place of the conflict, which means it's not really the top seven, it's just the top three that a Ford couldn't beat, and one of those is ours. We're building four of these. To complement our pre-existing 10 Nimitz-class supercarriers, you want to knock off a country, this is the tool for the job. You want to patrol the global sea lanes to make commerce safe, oh my god, this is a horrible choice, because there's only four of them. They can only be in four places at a time. Instead, you need these bad boys, destroyers. You need hundreds of them, probably 800 to patrol the global sea lanes. We have 70. Even if the United States wanted to be the guarantor of global commerce, we no longer have the capacity Western Hemisphere, sure, but the rest of the world, forget it. One of the weird little things about Russia is most of their petrochemical facilities were built in the 60s under Khrushchev. And the only reason they're still operating is you've had a lot of Western technology and Western investment and Western workers basically applying a lot of high-end duct tape to keep it all working. And they are now all gone. And we are already seeing industrial accidents in Russian industry that are so big, not that we can see them from orbit, we can detect them from orbit. All right, what's next? What we're looking at here is a pipeline map. Specifically, we are looking at the green pipes. Those are the oil pipes. And the two arrows are pointing at a pair of ports, one on the Baltic Sea in the north, that is Primorsk, and one on the Black Sea in the south, that's Novorossiysk. And the reason that these really matter is insurance. And I can just see everybody like, work with me? It gets really sexy really fast. You cannot have a vessel go into a port, out of a port, or go through a constrained waterway like, say, Suez without an insurance policy. And as of the first of the year, the Europeans said, no ship can get one of their policies. That's 90% of global coverage. In addition, the global reinsurance companies, those are firms that insure insurance companies, without sanctions and play it again, just said, we're never touching another Russian vessel again. Now, you're going to see in the news things about the price cap. That's all wrapped in, up into this. And everyone talks about the price cap because, ooh, sexy, they can only get like $40, whatever. It's the insurance that really matters, and it's already gone. So we have seen in just the last week and a half, exports out of the Russian space drop by about a million and a half barrels a day. Now, anything more than where we are now, that million and a half, things get really, really, really fast. Because this, this isn't Texas. In Texas, if for whatever reason, the ports can't get rid of the crude, they just shut in the well. They don't like to do it, but they can do it. But in Russia, if you shut in a well in the permafrost, which is where most of this stuff comes from, it freezes solid. And the water that comes up as a byproduct turns into ice, and when water, we were in Louisiana, you're like, what, what's ice? <laughs> When water freezes into ice, it expands and it pops the pipe from the inside. Now, they've got about a million and a half barrels a day that's further west that's not on the permafrost. That they can turn on and off. Any more than that, they're cutting into the permafrost wells. And the last time the permafrost wells went offline, it was 1989. And the Soviet system collapsed and they lost the entire network. And it took them 30 years to repair the damage. It's not quite right. It took Western techs 30 years to repair the damage, and the Western techs are gone. So we can very easily see a scenario where two to four million barrels a day of Siberian crude goes offline and does not come back for decades. 
And energy is not a normal product. Now, if you can't get wheat, you can eat corn. If you can't get corn, you can eat soy, whatever. If you can't get fuel, things stop. If you need a gallon of gas to get to work, but you can only get nine tenths of a gallon, not only will you pay whatever you have to do to get that last little bit, the price you pay for that determines the entire market. So just losing two million barrels a day of Siberian crude, you know, that's enough to jack energy prices up by 60 bucks, easily. And there's more where that came from. So remember, green, green's oil, right? We're now looking at the reds. The reds are natural gas. We're gonna start with that blue line. I'm sorry, that blue arrow at the top. That's the, uh, now I'm failure. That's the Nord Stream pop pipeline. It's not the marginal supplier for the Germans. It's their primary, it's 40% of the total. So, you know, a 2% change in supplies can generate a 50% change in price. This is 40% of their total demand. And back in September, somebody blew it up. It's gone, it's not coming back. Can't be repaired because there's now water corroding it from the inside, it's been too long. Americans talk a good game when it comes to paranoia about energy security. We're like, oh my God, energy independence, we gotta get it. But we really don't care. We bring in energy from Canada or Mexico or Saudi Arabia. And if we don't think anyone is really watching all that closely, we'll happily take a bunch from Venezuela. You can't do that in Germany. Precision manufacturing in a tough neighborhood. And not only do they bring in the natural gas to generate power, that's not its primary use. Its primary use is for petrochemicals. And those petrochemicals are not exported. No, no, no. They're kept in-house to be processed into regular manufactured goods. It's the base of the entire system. And it stopped. Now, they have replaced that 40% with seven different marginal suppliers. And so prices are six and seven times as a rule of what they were before the war. Now, if you've been following the news there recently, they're having a freakish heat wave in Germany too. It hit 50 degrees on New Year's in Berlin, which is like 185 billion degrees above normal. And so they're not using a lot of natural gas right now and prices are really under control. But that's what it took. They shut down their industrial usage of the stuff. They have their electricity generation and it took a free heat wave for getting them to get things back under control. And in order to do that, they only had to pay seven times market price for the natural gas. Can you imagine what happens with a cold snap? And they're never gonna refill with Russian natural gas again. They can't. Oh, and it'll get worse because those red arrows, that's the backup plan. Pipes that go through the conflict zone in an artillery war. Folks, if you want a Beamer, buy it now. <laughs> this is the last model. You should probably get 10 years of parts too. But we're looking at the end of the German manufacturing system in less than two years. The closest natural gas to Germany that's not Russian is in Nigeria. That's a 15 year program at least to get it online in there. All right. Oh, this is fun. So Chairman Xi of the People's Republic of China, head of the Communist Party, has now consolidated more power unto his person than any human in history. More than Caligula of Rome, more than the Kim Dynasty in North Korea, more than anyone at any time in any place. And as a result, things are breaking down. Even if he were the smartest person in human history, you can't manage a system of a billion and a half people by yourself. And he has now executed the messenger so many times that no one wants to bring him any information. Not information that they think will piss him off, any information, because they don't know the status of the voices in his head and they don't know what will trip him. So great example. You guys remember last, Last February? February before last? Sorry, New Year's, everything's fuzzy. February of 2021, the Chinese were experiencing rolling black and brownouts. Best guess is that Xi didn't find out until September. You know who told him? 
Joe Biden on a phone call. It just came up in conversation. Now, we're in the South. I'm going to guess that there's some fairly well-formed opinions about Uncle Joe in this room. <laughs> but do any of us, any of us, know anyone who thinks of Uncle Joe as a source of breaking news? <laughs> Last February, just before the Ukraine war started, during the Olympics, Putin was in town, and he lied to Xi's face. She asked him, are you going to invade Ukraine? And Putin was like, oh, why would I do that? It would be crazy. And you can see in the press conference, like the national security guys in the back of the room, is like, I, I feel like I should. And the other guy's like, no, shut up. You know what happened to the last guy? <laughs> and so Chairman Xi was the only world leader got caught completely with his pants down. He's bought into the Russian propaganda. And so he doesn't probably realize that they're about to lose a lot of Russian crude because of what's going on in the West with the, the sanctions. But he's also probably about to lose a lot of crude from Eastern Siberia because not one well in Eastern Siberia was built by the Russians. It was all done by BP, Halliburton, and the rest, and they're all gone. We've never had this sort of technical pullback from an oil project anywhere in modern history. We don't know how long the Russians can keep this going, but since you can see the accidents from orbit, I'm gonna guess not all that long. They're buying their own propaganda. Oh, let's talk about COVID, that's fun. Whee! Okay, uh, I'm gonna guess that we have been exposed in our personal and our professional lives to a diversity of thoughts on COVID. And I think most of them can roughly go into one of two buckets. So bucket one, natural immunity is the way out of this. Bucket two, vaccines are how we move on. But I think if we're all being really honest with ourselves, not, not each other, not with me, with ourselves, at home, in the dark, with the doors locked and the blinds pulled alone, we will admit that there's some points on the other side of the discussion that are worth considering. Is that fair? Can't have that conversation in China. And not simply because it's an information controlled area. The CCP was successful at keeping COVID out of the general population. No one has natural immunity. Space, they are tilted on their side because I'm an author and if you have to tilt your head to follow along, that is fine. I'm not going to judge out loud. On the right, that orange, that orange is, the lighter color of orange is population density, and it's roughly the population density of Kansas. If you melon scoop out Topeka and Kansas City. So you do know your neighbors, you've probably lost track of their day-to-day -day lives. If you go to the left, you are now looking at an economic and climate map. And that green V in the middle that roughly overlaps where the people live, that's the Russian wheat belt. And in economic terms of the world's major agricultural zones, that is the least productive spot on the planet. You can grow one crop of short season wheat per year and that's it. In the summer, the climate is about like Western Kansas. And in the winter, it is roughly like northeastern Alberta. So hot and dry or cold, dry, windy. The income that comes from that one crop of wheat is so low per acre that the Russians even today have never been able to successfully build a road network. Ugh. You want to move anything of volume in the Russian system, you have to do it by rail. Now, if you move it to the left, if you go to the yellow to the south, that's desert, completely empty. If you go to the right to the blue, you're now in tundra and taiga, also empty. But what really drives the Russians to drink is the beige. Territories that are completely empty and by Russian definition, totally useless, but totally flat. And you can totally get a Mongol horde through that. Russia's been invaded 50 odd times in its history. And never once, when the foe has made it to the green, made it to the good land, have the Russians ever ejected them. It's been the weather that's done the heavy lifting. So the Russian strategy since the beginning has always been the same. Expand out of the green, through the beige, and you get to those red markers, those geographic barriers that you can't shove a panzer division through. 
And then you forward position your very, very slow moving rail supplied troops in those blue access points that are between those barriers. The Soviet system was the height of Russian security. They controlled all of those access points and then they lost them all. Post-Soviet Russia, especially under Putin, has spent every waking moment trying to rebuild that outer shell. And in the 23 years that Putin has been in charge, he has launched now eight military conflicts with that in mind to rebuild those footprints. This is the Georgia War. This is the Crimea War, the Donbas War, the Kazakh intervention, the Karabakh War. Unfortunately for Ukraine, it's not that Ukraine controls these access points, but it's on the way to the two most important ones. And as long as that is the case, Russia will not stop until it has all of Ukraine, and then it will continue beyond Ukraine. We're only midway through this story. Now, you guys remember back in the first week of the war when we thought this was gonna all be over really quickly? How on the fourth day, we had that 40 mile long convoy of vehicles going from Belarus south towards Kiev. It was like, crap, this is it. And then on the fourth day of the war, the convoy stopped because they forgot fuel. <laughs> and then on the seventh day of the war, all the soldiers dismounted from their equipment and walked back to Belarus because they also forgot food. And everyone I know at every defense ministry across NATO thought the same thing. Well, holy crap, the Russians don't know how to fight a modern war at all. They've forgotten all of the lessons they've learned in the last 200 years. It's a parade force. They're doing worse than the Iraqis did in 1992. If we go head to head with Russia, there will be a thousand to one casualty ratios. It will be a wipeout. And this made no one happy at all because the Russians see this war accurately as an existential battle for their survival. They know if they fail at this, they are completely exposed to whatever's next and their demographic situation is so horrible. This is the last generation that they have soldiers to fight. So if we do have a direct confrontation with NATO, they will use every tool they have and there will be a general nuclear exchange. So the decision was made very, very early in Washington and London and Berlin and the rest that we have to destroy the Russian military capacity to function here now in Ukraine, but without a single set of NATO boots on the ground. And so any equipment that the Ukrainians can prove that they can operate competently that doesn't violate our security, they can have. And there's right now 60,000 Ukrainian troops training across NATO countries right now. They will all be back in theater by May when the spring offensive begins. That was our lesson. The Russians had their own lesson. They're like, okay, maybe we drank a bit too much of our own Kool-Aid. Maybe these are not Jewish Nazi gay demons. And uh, maybe they're just people who are fighting for their home. And if that's the case, if they're going to fight for their home, then the civilian population is no longer a non-issue. It's a problem. Well, we can reach into our own history and find a strategy for that. We could advance very, very slowly behind a never-ending hail of artillery fire, not targeting anything that moves, targeting anything that stands. Because if we can obliterate every scrap of civilian infrastructure, then Ukraine cannot support an industrial level population. And the population will self-segregate into two groups. Group number one will run. We never have to worry about them again. Group number two, if they stay behind and they're under age 55, they clearly stayed to fight and we can shoot them on site. Getting good data out of a war zone is always hard, especially when one side is pathologically lying about any data that there might be. We don't know how many people have been killed, how many civilians have been killed. The estimates I've seen are somewhere probably between 100 and 300,000. That's approximately the same pace in the first year of the Holocaust during World War II. This war, like everything with the Russians, is ultimately about scale. You can see that Texas is up there to give you an idea of scale. The Russians are trying to build a defensive perimeter on a border that's three times the length of ours with half the population. 
and they're trying to do it with numbers. Okay. What we're looking at here is a map of the conflict zone. Now those dotted lines are those all important rail lines. The deep red are the territories that the Russians controlled at the end of the last war. Remember, this is the eighth time that the Russians have launched a military attack since 1999. The really fun part starts right here. This is the Kyrgyzstan pocket. This is the only chunk of territory that was west of the Dnieper River, that's kind of like their Mississippi, that the Russians were able to capture early in the war. And starting in about July, the Ukrainians advertised publicly that that's where they were going first. This is the chunk of territory they wanted to liberate first. The Russians saw those advertisements, and so they moved about 20, 25,000 of their best forces to the other side of the river to reinforce. Best equipment they have. On November 1, that assault did begin. But as we all know, that wasn't the whole story. There was also a second assault right here because the Russians had to move their troops from somewhere, and the Ukrainians waited to see where they were being pulled from. And in that assault, the entirety of Kharkiv province fell within five days. Even better than that, this little dingleberry right here, you guys see that? That is Izium. That was the Russians' forward logistical base. It's a rail hub. They were planning on launching multiple assaults from that next spring to basically capture a huge chunk of Russia, or excuse me, Ukrainian territory. It fell in 36 hours, intact. And in 36 hours, the Ukrainians captured more gear, more tanks, more artillery, more shells, more gasoline from the Russians than they started the war with. More than we had transferred to Ukraine in seven months. Big win. And then they went on to capture Kyrgyzstan as well and got about half as much again equipment. So the Ukrainians at the moment are going through six months of deferred maintenance on a lot of Russian gear with the hope of getting it all into working order by the time we get to May. Which means that now we're in a bit of a different kind of conflict. Things are kind of stalled because the weather has been weird. Normally at this time in the year, everything would be frozen solid and you'd have tanks running around everywhere. But it's abnormally warm throughout Europe, including in Ukraine. It's about 40 degrees in Kiev today, which means everything's really muddy. And we're not talking like Louisiana mud here. You know, you can like have a fan boat and go over that crap. We're talking about like deep churning clay-based mud.